welcome to where are the disabled superheroes talking about disabled representation in superhero media i'm jennifer lee rossman i use they them pronouns um i am an author and editor from binghamton new york and i i'm sorry I, my notes are not useful and my panelists if you can introduce yourself um start with kat Hello there, I'm Kat Gordon. Um, I'm an autistic, disabled, and queer Canadian writer of speculative fiction that celebrates diversity. Um, I've authored Life in the Cosm, The Stealth Lovers, and the upcoming Iris and the Crew Tear Through Space. My short stories appear in Alison Bound Beyond Wonderland, We Shall Be Monsters, Space Opera Libretti, which was co edited by Jennifer Lee Rossman and stargazers micro tales from the cosmos in 2016 i founded the spoonie authors network and in 2018 and 2021 i joined talia c johnson to co-edit nothing without us which was a 2020 pre-aurora award finalist and nothing without us two which dropped september 15th of this year these anthologies are multi-genre collections of stories whose authors and their protagonists are disabled deaf or hard of hearing, blind or visually impaired, neurodivergent, spoony, and or they manage mental illness. Oh, and what is your, do you have a favorite superhero? Yes, I, I do. I mean, Deadpool, because Deadpool. <laughs> Good answer. Um, Nathan, going to introduce yourself and tell us your favorite superhero? Sure. So my name is Nathan Frechette. Uh, I am an author, publisher, um, comic book artist, illustrator. I do many, many things. Um, I am the publisher for Press Renaissance Press, which is uh, the publisher that's releasing Nothing Without Us and Nothing Without Us 2, as well as the uh, mighty anthology, which Jennifer will be editing in 2023. Um, yeah, we do, uh, at Renaissance, we do mostly, uh, well, our motto is um, Diverse Canadian Voices, which means that we uh, care a lot about publishing and uplifting the voices of communities who have been historically marginalized, such as the disabled community. And uh, my favorite superhero is pretty easy. I actually named my second son Xavier for Professor Charles Xavier. <laughs> nice. Um, Ash, you want to introduce yourself and tell us your favorite superhero? I'm Ash. Uh, I'm a physically disabled, mad, autistic academic. I'm doing my PhD in critical disability studies, and I specialize in a lot of areas, um, disability in the media um, and uh, disability history. So, uh, and my favorite superhero is Ms. Marvel. Thank you. And I forgot to answer my own question. My favorite superhero is Agent Phil Coulson because he doesn't want to be a superhero really. And neither do I, but stuff happens. <laughs> so, First question, why is good rep disability representation important in superhero media? Uh, Nathan? All right, well, I'm going to start with, um, so I have so many thoughts about this. First of all, mm -hmm. it's, it's really important for, for people to see themselves on, on screen, in media, in comic books, in, in books, uh, in, in all sorts of, of media like this, because it is really disheartening when you admire people and none of them are like you. Um, and, and it makes you feel like there are things that you can never achieve, that you can never become, uh, because you don't see yourself out there. But I think it's even more important because there is representation uh, out there. There is massive representation of people who, like me, are, are um, uh, suffer from mental illness, for example. And it's bad. It's terrible. It's it's horrible. I personally I have DID, and I have almost never seen a story that didn't cast people like me as a serial killer. 
Um, and, and you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the movie Split that came out a few years ago uh, as just one of the latest in a long history of this happening. Uh, and it was meant to be like a superhero. And again, because there is DID involved, it had to be a serial killer. Um, so, you know, it's it's so harmful when when you see the only thing out there that you see that is like yourself is a serial killer. Like, I, I can't even describe how that makes you feel. And it's not just about that, but like, I don't disclose my condition to a lot of people because it makes them think that I'm going to be dangerous for them, which is a dangerous situation for me. Um, I also think that having good disability representation is good for abled people to see things like that so that they are more aware of, hey, people like this can be in movies. People like this can do good things. It's not just for us beneficial, it's for everyone. Um, Ash. Um, yeah, I agree very much with uh, Nathan. Like we need good representation because there is so much bad representation. Like I am mentally ill. I have been forcibly confined to a psych ward, which yeah, comes with the, are you a serial killer questions? And like, who can you tell that that happened to you? And like relationships with like authority figures, like police were involved. So that um, the way that, you know, you are dehumanized in the real world is impacted by what we see on the screen. Like there have been studies that have shown that there, if there is good, positive, accurate representation, which very much includes when we are talking about films specifically, um, authentically casting those roles and uh, having disabled people on screen like changes the way society perceives disabled people. And because so much of disability in the media it is either fake or very stereotyped, um, we aren't seeing the, the um, progress we could. It's called uh, um, cultural annihilation. When you don't see yourself in media, um, it's as though you don't exist within the culture. Hmm. That's something I'll need to look up later. That's very interesting. Um, Kat, do you have anything to add about this? Well, I think I'm gonna be kind of echoing a lot of what was said, because um, it's all valid. Um, you know, on the, you know, the point about how it's encouraging for uh, disabled folks to find characters in fiction who remain disabled, they don't, they circumvent any cure narratives, and yet still they could do superhero -y things. That's great for people who have been disabled all their lives, but also for people who are newly disabled, because uh, when I became disabled, I felt kind of hashtag disabled and alone. And if I saw a lot of media and, and, uh, that had characters like me, it would make me feel less alone and, and just kind of give me the confidence of, oh yeah, okay, you know, like this is my life now, but I can do stuff, right? Um, the, the other thing, again, just kind of echoing what, what Ash said was that, uh, fiction, I believe, has a huge world impact, you know, um, sometimes even more than nonfiction. I always joke that if you're watching this on a cell phone, it's because somebody watched Star Trek, the original series, and said, we should have these handheld things, right? Um, but, and, and again, because of fiction's ability to influence, when you have harmful tropes, and I, as an autistic person, I see a lot of harmful autistic tropes. A lot of times people who are not autistic will say that I'm not autistic because I'm not like such and such a character, you know, and that's not okay because we're not a monolith, right? So yeah, I mean, pretty much what other people had said. Oh, 
my next question kind of dovetails into that one because it's all about um, disability is often used to show that someone is a villain or it is a punishment or something to cure. Can you think of any examples of this and how would you fix it if you were to rewrite that story? Um, Ash. Can you repeat the first part of the question? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Um, can you think of any examples of um, disability being used as a punishment, a cure, or a reason for someone being a villain? And how would you fix it if you rewrote the story? Well, I mean, the, the most, I think one of the more recent ones is of course, Wonder Woman, Dr. Poison, who's in who has a facial difference. Facial difference is so common as a villain trope. And I know it's not technically comic book superhero, but I would put like James Bond in the same sort of like genre. Right. And, like how many of James Bond villains have been disabled in some way, usually with some sort of facial difference. And it's just, I mean, just don't do that. Seem like, I mean, it's not even that hard. Like, just don't. Right. Like, that is not a situation where, like, as soon as you're using disability as kind of metaphor, that is a, where I'm mean, generally all for more disabled people in the media. But the second you're doing it as a metaphor, yeah, no, you can go ahead and stop and maybe not do that. <laughs> Um, when I was researching things for this panel, I found out that in some of the comic books, um, when Thor was sent to Earth, he was punished by being a disabled person. He needed to walk with a cane. And that was um, his father's way of um, like knocking him down a peg. And I think it could be even more effective if he took away his superpowers instead make him a normal mortal, disabled or not, but take away the thing that makes him special, not take away the thing that is just making him disabled. That shouldn't be a punishment. Exactly. And like, I'm just thinking, I just watched Wonder Woman 84 for the first time yesterday. I was getting mm -hmm. prepared. And like, okay. she starts losing her powers in that movie um, because she wishes that her love interest from the first movie would come back from the dead, which he does, sort of. And uh, the thing that she has to give up in order for him to be there is she starts losing her powers. It's very like vague because she doesn't really, like she slowly loses them. She still manages to turn an airplane invisible. So it's like, it's not even well done. Mm -hmm. Like <laughs> if you're going to do it, commit to the bit. Right. And, um, but so that was just like awful and it's just and then like the whole premise at the end is you have to let this man you love go because the world needs this super person to be super like that that is a necessary thing for the world if wonder woman stopped being wonder woman that is like unimaginable it kind of sounds like a metaphor for you can't be disabled and have a love interest too. Very much. Um, Kat, do you have any examples? So I was thinking uh, on the superhero side and I was thinking on the villain side. So on the villain side, very much again, echoing, um, sorry, is it Kim or Ash do I use? Ash, I, Ash echoing what Ash was saying that um, in fact, I was even thinking of that exact character from the Wonder Woman series, and that a lot of times the evil villains have uh, some kind of uh, facial injury or, or an amputated limb or, or things like that. Um, Peter Pascal actually starts to become very ill in that film, and he's the villain. So Interesting. Um, how, how would I redo it? Um, probably like have someone who's disabled be tempted 
to become a villain because that's what all the villains, all the disabled people seem to do, but then realize the real enemy is ableism, <laughs> you know, um, and eugenics. And so they'll build a layer and, and, and create a life where only like the eugenics people will think they're a villain, but the disabled people will think they're a superhero. Hero. So that's how I would probably, I mean, I would read the heck out of something like that or watch the heck out of that. Um, yeah, I like that. <laughs> right? Uh, and in terms of the superhero part, like um, I haven't watched the entire series, but they often talk about Daredevil, you know, mm -hmm. who's a blind superhero. And the biggest complaint I hear, and again, I'm a sighted person, so, you know, just take it with a grain of salt, but the biggest complaint that I do hear is that trope of the, you know, the other senses become heightened in that. And I thought in terms of redoing it, what would I like to see? I would love to see a reboot of the exact same character written and acted by, by folks who are uh, blind or visually impaired. Like, what extra nuances would we find? Like, how would that character be written through the lens of and acted through the lens of people with that lived experience? So that's kind of where I went there. That's a good idea. Um, Nathan. So a, a few of the examples that I had in mind have already uh, been mentioned, but I, I don't know why I keep thinking about there's this movie that I really adored when I was a young teenager, like maybe 12 or 13, called Adventures in Babysitting. And it, <laughs> I know it's it's a problematic movie in many ways, but, uh, it, you know, it, it's uh, quite fun and and it brought me a lot of uh, of joy as a child. And I, I rewatched it recently because I was showing it to my spouse. And there's this scene in it where they're stuck with their car on the highway and this tow truck driver comes and he comes out and he has a hook for a hand. And they're all terrified of him because he has a hook for a hand. And that, you know, watching it as an adult, it just struck me how you know, instantly, that was a recognizable signal of this person is an amputee, therefore, he is evil, and probably a killer. And I was just, you know, and it turns out that he's, he's, you know, not exactly um, playing with a full set of cards, but uh, and, and then he goes on and does like these things. And it turns out that their first impression is justified. And I was like, how, what, what message is this sending? And, and how deeply ingrained in our social psyche is it that you see someone who has a disability and immediately your first thought, and it doesn't even have to be explained in the movie, it's immediately understood by the audience that this person must be evil. It was just mind boggling. It shouldn't be such a society-wide shortcut for evil. Absolutely. It was just basically shorthand for evil. And, and the audience just gets it. I got it as like a 12-year-old kid who'd never yeah. been exposed to someone who was an amputee. I was just like, oh, of course, this guy is evil. It was, yeah. Well, disability as villain has existed in media and literature for forever. I mean, particularly the mentally ill villain. Thank the mad woman in the attic is very common um, and overdone and definitely the actual victim of the situation, but that's <laughs> not how it gets played. And it's been around, like, I mean, yeah, for so long, just centuries, this is yeah. how disability has been portrayed. So that brings me to my next question. Is bad representation better than no representation? Um, and when, so for my example is, um, as a sighted person watching Daredevil, I see that he is blind, but all of his superpowers basically negate that in most instances. Is it still good that, oh, look, we have a disabled superhero, even if we do it wrong or would it be better not to do that at all um 
uh, Kat, what are your thoughts? So it, it, it's kind of, it, you would think this would be like supremely easy for me to answer. <laughs> My brain goes off in many directions, right? Um, so my gut instinct is it's never good to have bad representation. But then I kind of went, well, we're rebooting everything these days. Like, you know, like everything's being rebooted a bajillion times. So maybe the stuff that's already out there that can be problematic, let's just do a reboot, you know? And then for new stuff, you know, um, because nowadays too, I, I think I think we... Or at least, I don't know, maybe it's my microcosm, but I see a lot of access to a lot of, of, of writers and authors out there who are disabled and deaf and blind and neurodivergent and stuff. So, I mean, you know, hire them to create new characters, you know, hire actors to play those characters. So, yeah, I guess I guess my opinion is let's re reboot <laughs> the problematic stuff and then create some new stuff without giving in to those tropes. Right. You could have the bad representation be the driving force behind better representation, whereas you might not notice if there was no representation. That's, I struggled with this question too, and I wrote it. <laughs> um, uh, Ash, what do you think about this? I don't know, like it always comes back to whenever, like, I mean, people, disabled people have been getting a little more traction publicly around having media listen somewhat to our complaints about terrible representation. But like, because terrible representation is bigotry and it harms us. So it's kind of hard to get on the, any representation. So there, people are always coming, but isn't it better to have some representation than no representation? And my answer to that is there should be good representation. Like right. it shouldn't be that dichotomy. And the fact that, that it continues to be put to us that way is part of the problem because, you know, all these major studios and um, comic book publishers like Marvel, DC, they have the money, they can do it. And, um, you know, T. Franklin has been writing um, Harley Quinn and uh, Ivy, Harley and Ivy um, comic books now, and she is herself disabled and has, you know, been inputting that into her work. And so, like, it is possible. It, it just needs to get beyond um, the anecdotal stage, because right now it's still very much a, oh, we did it once. Isn't that good enough? Right. No. <laughs> Do it more. Do it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> um Nathan I'm gonna echo Kat's thought that it's it's a complicated question it's yeah. not there are levels of bad representations you know there's the clumsy you didn't quite get it right but you kind of tried uh you know like I think daredevil kind of like falls into that because it's it's not great you know, um, representation, but then there are things that are downright harmful, uh, like, you know, like I mentioned split or like these, these stories that get the idea in our heads that, you know, disabled people are evil. Um, there are stories, there are representations, cases of representation that will, for example, that convince people that all mentally ill people are, are dangerous and, and, you know, have the potential to be a killer, even though the reality is that we're disproportionately more likely to be the victims of violence than we are to be the perpetrator. Um, and then there's, you know, all of these ideas that will also drill in your head that if someone looks different, if someone's face looks different, they must be a villain. They must have, like, it must be a reflection of some kind of corruption in their soul or, or whatnot you know like there are degrees to which like uh, having horrible representation having representation that convinces people that we are evil or a drain on the world or or you know otherwise unworthy of of love or life or dignity that should not exist at all 
And, you know, having the choice between re being represented consistently as a serial killer and not being represented at all, I probably opt for the second option. But, oh. you know, uh, I, I do want to see people, a diversity of people that reflects the diversity of the world that I witness in the media that I consume. So it's, it's, it is definitely a very complicated question. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about good representation. Um, spoilers for, I think, third season of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. But when Phil Coulson loses his arm, he doesn't automatically get used to his prosthetic. Yes, it's awesome. It has powers it has a shield that comes out of it but you also see him struggling with it you see him that he can't tie his own tie and it bothers him I thought that was more of a realistic depiction of losing an ability because you're fine you've got it you've got all these adaptive equipments but it takes a while to be okay with it in your own mind um can't do you have any good representation you can think of? I I believe I do. Um, so I'm DC superhero girls. Okay, the new one with the super me that theme song. <laughs> I I I love this series so much, and I guess it's just the way it hits me. Um, like I feel like the teenage um, bat girl feels like the bouncy, bouncy, enthusiastic ADHD friend, you know? She gets an idea, she's hyper-focused, and, and, and I, I love that. And maybe it's just how I interpret the character. I don't know if the character's been deliberately um, created that way, but that's how I react to the character. Like, she could be one of my buds. Um, and, uh, and then I think of also Bumblebee. Like Bumblebee has a lot of anxiety. She has fears and anxiety and she still invents her things and, you know, is part of the team and nobody tries to change these characters. You know, they're still welcomed and friends. And, and I, in my life with my disabled and neurodivergent friends, that's how we are. Like we don't try to change. We're there to support, we're there to encourage. So I really like that. Um, I'm always just gonna say Deadpool without even giving any explanation. So I'm just gonna say Deadpool. Um, and uh, and I'll never stop believing the X-Force Deadpool. So um, a couple of other things, the Scarlet Witch in WandaVision, I thought was a very creative way to have um, a, a superhero process trauma and grief. Like it was just a different way to do it. So I just found that kind of fascinating. And don't yeet me into the sun, because I know this is technically space opera, but the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. Look, Jedi, to me, are the superheroes of science fiction. So, But when I saw the Obi-Wan Kenobi series and realized this is like amazing PTSD representation, you know, like yeah. Obi-Wan Kenobi went through stuff. And, and so did the villain. She went through stuff and, okay. and, you know, it was nothing that it was nothing that they could just shake off and go and live with on with their lives. They had to process through a lot of intense trauma and do it in, in the Star Wars milieu. And I, I was blown away. I think I even wrote a blog saying that Obi-Wan Kenobi is the mental health rep that I didn't know I needed. So <laughs> that, yeah, that's how I feel with that. <laughs> Um, Nathan. So I'm going to come back to my favorite superhero because um, I, I was growing up, I was a huge, huge, huge fan of the X-Men. Um, I bought every, like I had a, a comic box at the comic book store when my X-Men would come yeah. in. And that was before there were like 20,000 different series. Um, but, you know, I used to read religiously uh, the X-Men and Charles Xavier was always a, a really positive example of a disability for me because like, you know, he, he is physically disabled. He has mobility issues, obviously. And it, you know, it's, what he does is completely separate from that. And, and it's not, 
you know, it comes up in the story from time to time where like there are places he just can't go. There are like, you know, a, he his wheelchair does not go everywhere. It's not like a floating wheelchair. It's, you know, it's a it's a wheelchair. And the reality of that is made clear in several story arcs where you see like, you know, people having to transport him and having to like do like think about uh, our alternative means of transportation for him. And, and it doesn't, it impacts the story only in which like, okay, well, you know, we have this barrier, let's figure out how to get across it. And, and his superpowers are, are completely separate from that and don't negate the effect of, it, of his disability and he just lives with it and it's not like you don't it's not like a, a whole constant thing where they're like talking about it and how to cure him it's not even on his mind that being cured from this disability because it's just who he is and oh. you know i've always thought that if you're writing disability this is the way that it should be hmm. yeah i've always thought the x-men are a little bit of a um allegory for disability anyway because of everyone's different. Some of them can mask in the real world, quote unquote. Others can't, they have different needs and the government wants to cure them. Some of them want the cure, others don't, but there's that slippery slope of they don't care what people want. Absolutely. It, it really, uh, you know, goes into eugenics and, and you know, the, the cure narrative and the normalcy narrative as well. Mm. Uh, Great metaphor. Good use of metaphor. <laughs> I'm going um, to interrupt really quickly. It's the bottom of the hour. We've only got about three questions. So did you want to continue with your X-Men metaphor, which is I know is the next question? Um, and, then, and then we will go into question Q&A. Um, I, I was actually going to go into the, um, what would your weaknesses and strengths be? Okay, let's do that, and then we'll go into Q and A. Okay. So, if you were going to incorporate your disability into a superhero, what would your abilities and weaknesses be? Um, Ash. I don't know. I don't really, because I have so many disabilities. Like I have cerebral palsy. So I'm physically disabled. I'm autistic. I'm mentally ill. Um, so, I mean, I just want to be able to walk through walls. Does my disability have to come into it? No. <laughs> um, like I always thought it would be me if I had like telepathy or um, telekinesis so I could get things that are far away, but I never thought about using that to walk. So probably my weakness would be my muscular dystrophy makes it only I can pick up certain things with my mind, only I'm still weak, even though I have superpowers. Um, Nathan. I'm in the same situation as Ash. I have chronic illness. I'm neurodivergent, a physically disabled mobility impaired. I have mental illness. So like, yeah, and you know, I, the one, well, it's not true. I have a few abilities that I've always wanna have. The, my one ability is shape shifting because that, you know, I'm also transgender and, and I've always had the, the fantasy of just being able to switch like that, you know? Um, but it, there are so many superpowers that I would like to have. And you know what? I, none of them really have to do with my disability. Like I would love to be able to teleport. I would love to be able to like heal people and heal people in the way that, you know, like alleviate their suffering and not necessarily fix what I perceive to be wrong with them. Um, so, so that's, that's a thing. I also just wanted to like do a sidebar and point out that there are some comments and questions in the chat that are I thought were interesting if we if we want to read those out loud when we're done. Um, yes, uh, Kat, do you have any um, disability weaknesses, superpowers you want to talk about? I have a few things, but this is an awkward question for me to answer <laughs> because I'm working on a story for Mighty. <laughs> uh, uh so I'm not going to go into the heavy, heavy details because you're a decision maker. But sometimes I even find, though, writing short stories, regardless of whether they get published, you're doing them for you, right? It's cathartic. Um, so the story 
that I'm working on is going to be a an accidental superhero who is autistic um, and a woman in her 50s because you know we should see older folks and as superheroes as well um, and she's autistic from beginning to the end of the, the story but she acquires a superpower in a bizarre electrical uh, accident that ends up working with her advocacy uh, against people who try to propagate harmful tropes against autistics, but it's done in a very comedic way, which um, plays on my, my snark. Um, I think you could do things also in a funny way. I think humor is, you can, can be integrated into a, a story like that. Um, uh, and and uh, co comedy and silliness are my things. And I pass the concept through to a few of my other fellow autistic and neurodivergent friends and they told me to go for it. So I'm having fun with that. <laughs> but yeah, no, no cure narrative, just um, advocacy in a very different kind of way. <laughs> That's all I'm saying. Well, I can't wait to read that. <laughs> so Rhea, you had questions in, in the chat? Yeah, uh, um, just so the those attending know, Jennifer asked me to read the questions and whatnot because she can't access them. Um, this next, the first one isn't a question. It's actually something that was covered already in the discussion, but Nicole Wilson had spoke of resenting the notion that if you have a mental, emotional disability, you're either serial killer or suicidal, makes people unwilling to deal with you, and that there's lots between these extremes. This was discussed in the um, panel, but I just thought I'd mention it. Hmm. Nicole also asked a question, has any of you seen the TV series Once Upon a Time? Yes. Um, yes. yes. Okay. Because she asked about the character of Captain Hook in particular. There is an episode where he gets his hand back, but he thinks it's evil. And she wanted to know, those of you that have seen that thing, what you thought of that storyline. So Jennifer, I'll start with you since you said you've seen it. That very well, I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, no, I don't remember that episode. <laughs> okay, but in general, then if you get if you get something back, and then, but this was discussed also in the panel where you said um, uh, about Colson getting his arm back. Nathan, go ahead. So. I haven't seen Once Upon a Time, but um, I'm very old and uh, show that I did see his uh, <laughs> angel in, in the 90s. And there is a character who loses a hand and gets it back. And it is an actual evil hand that he gets back. Uh, it's not his hand. It is the hand of uh, someone who was an actual killer. And it's, it's, a very, it's a very interesting episode because like his hand keeps doing things that he doesn't want it to do and um it's uh, i thought that it was it was well done in that you know they got into the whole like there is a huge price for uh getting his hand back and it doesn't actually belong to him it was stolen from this other person um anyway i thought that i haven't seen like i said captain hook but i thought that that was particularly it was done okay. There were some problems with it, but there are a lot of questions that it raised, uh, you know, with regards to ethics and and um, morality and and you know what what does it mean to get something that you lost back like this? And uh, I thought it was interesting. So Sonder asks if there are examples of heroes with disabilities in other cultures, such as Greek mythology, Hindu gods, the Ganesh, or breaking down the binary of good and evil. Um, my mythology isn't that strong, so. Greek mythology absolutely um, has disabled gods, um, whose name is now escaping me, but, um, Hephaestus? Hephaestus, yes, Hephaestus, um, who is married to Aphrodite. Um, not that that is working out well for either of them, but um, yeah, Hephaestus is the god 
of fire and um, blacksmiths. So, I mean, he is still portrayed, he's portrayed as being a, a hunchback. So, but he's still can portrayed as, you know, being physically able. So there's, you know, still some issues, but this recognition that deity did not simply need to be, you know, peak of human excellence, which is, you know, often how Greek gods are portrayed, particularly in modern iterations of them. Whereas, you know, the Greek gods were very much problematic figures and would have been seen, you know, like they would have been interpreted as problematic figures at, during the time when they were worshipped because, you know, they're going around trying to kill babies all the time. That's Hera, by the way. She's always out. And she's the, the goddess of motherhood and her whole shtick is killing babies. It's very specific motherhood. Not that one. This one. <laughs> exactly. <clears throat> and um, in Norse mythology, isn't um, Balder um, blind? His brother. Know. His brother. Yeah. I can't remember. And then the Loki name. uses that to have <laughs> Balder killed, I think. Okay, yeah. With the mistletoe. Um, the next one, has anyone seen the Steel movie Steel? No. Laura M. says uh, there's someone there in a wheelchair who she thought they did a decent job of portrayal of that one. Yeah. But if no. we haven't seen the movie, we'll let that one go. Um, Rob McDonald asks, can you guys recommend some nonfiction books, articles, essays, etc.? And he suggests this to all of you. Um, for with advice for writers to do pro positive appropriation representation, positive and appropriate representation. Is there resource materials for authors? Kat. Yeah, I did write this in the chat. So in the Spoonie Authors Network website, um, and I put the link in the chat, SpoonieAuthorsNetwork.com, we have a resource menu and we have um, a series done by Derek Newman still called Disability Tropes 101. That's one place you can go. I mean, one of the big things is if you're going to include a disabled character is, you know, hiring a sensitivity reader to check the work before publication and to actually do that meaningfully, not be like, oh, I asked a disabled person, but I didn't actually take any of their advice. But yeah, would be hiring sensitivity readers would be my, my suggestion. And also just with what Ash said on the Spoonie Authors Network under the resource menu, there are uh, there is a page that lists different sensitivity editors as well if you're just searching. And I double like check. To, I'm sorry, you go ahead. Sorry, I would like to add to that that it's not just um, uh, sensitivity editors too, because like sensitivity editors can only do so much. Um, I would, if you are, if you want to include a disabled character in your your book, first of all, and that's true for any any representation at all. Uh, ask yourself why you know, why you want to do this. Um, and if you have the resources to be able to write about it in the first place, um, you know, there are a lot of people who, who want to write stories about, uh, you know, that want to include people of a certain um, marginalized community just because they feel that it's popular. And that is a, 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 a almost certain recipe for disaster. Um, you know, if, if you have people in your life who have uh, certain disabilities, have conversations with them, you know, ask them what they think about certain things, about certain media, about, about how they're being represented right now in, in, in media and see what has been done, but also consume fiction. 
um, that has good representation. I'm, I'm going to toot Cat's horn here, but uh, Nothing Without Us and the upcoming Nothing Without Us too is our great examples of disability representation done well. Um, so that gives you an idea of, of the kind of things that you want to represent. But really do some research, Google things, speak to people who have that lived experience and see what they think. And I would suggest um, just a simple thing, like if you're going to use a certain word to describe a person or their disability or condition, Google that word with the word ableist and see if it's an appropriate word to use or if it's a word that bothers disabled people. It's a very simple thing to make sure that you don't instantly turn people off by using a slur by mistake. Okay, we actually have time for only one more question because we want closing thoughts. Um, do look in the chat, people, because um, our panelists have been posting um, things like The Mighty is an anthology of disabled superheroes with submissions open. Um, so do look in the chat. They have been posting links and places you should go. One last question. Um, this one is from Renee Bennett. What do you think of the Punisher as a man who is going through massive mental health crisis, but who uses it to do violence? She also didn't give it to anyone in particular. So if anyone wants to address that. But to me, that strikes as going back to the beginning. He's doing violence with his mental issues. But. He's doing violence, but he does it in a very specific way. He follows a code. He doesn't just do violence to be violent. He's a man who has severe PTSD from so many things and he is violent, but he channels it towards bad people. It's, he does it more than he should, but he doesn't kill good people. He does it to protect people. And he, he is a good person who does very bad things for good reasons-ish. <laughs> I also want to add that it's it's you know he he does it in a way that's very deliberate and it, he doesn't exactly do it in a way in the way that is usually represented when people talk about mental illness causing violence you know a lot of the time you have people who are experiencing like a crisis doing things that they are not in control of whereas uh, um the the punisher you know he, he plans what he's doing he he's he researches the people that he's killing to make sure that they are in his mind villains uh and and it's there is there is a, a difference there, I think. There is, but I think one of the problems with um, the Punisher, because it's like, I mean, it's a fascinating sort of anti-hero story, but um, because there is that lack of accurate and like positive um, representation of people with mental illness, um, people don't understand the difference between someone who is mentally ill but is meticulously planning horrific, horrific violence and you know it's Canadian so I'm pretty sure the reference still works even though it was a while ago that man who uh, decapitated a kid on uh, the bus on the Greyhound right like the, the, like they don't understand the difference between um, whether like criminal um, culpability and not being being so out of control of your actions that you're not criminally responsible. Because you know, I'm sure there would be in the comments on the Punisher, oh, he would probably try the insanity defense. Well, if he did, it wouldn't work. <laughs> Like it wouldn't work. And as we know, like in real life, um, unfortunately, prisons are one of the primary, apparently, sources of mental health care, which I'm pretty sure is probably very bad at mental health care. Um, the, if you're, if like prison is where you have to go to get it. So, I mean, and that also feeds into this idea of people with mental illness being violent regardless of what those people are in prison for or you know 
the ways in which other factors may have contributed to their criminal behavior. Like the Punisher is just not an accurate representation of like a criminal with mental illness. Like he is not the the standard, but people would consider him to be closer to the standard than, you know, people stealing because they're having a psychotic episode or, you know, because they're confused. Yeah, all the nuance is lost as soon as he gets violent because that's all people see. I think it's also important to point out that um, it's, it's a reflection not of how many people with mental illness are in prison, but how our um, public health system is completely inadequate to help oh, yeah. anyone with a mental illness. Um, honestly, there, the incidence of people with a mental illness inside and outside of prison is the same. It's the same. You're not more likely to be in prison because you have a mental illness. Yeah. Um, but you are more likely to get care in prison for a mental illness because our system is just not prepared or, or, or funded to handle people who are um, who have mental illness and are not currently in crisis. It is hardly able to handle the people who are in crisis. So it's not. Sorry? I've been there and uh, yeah, didn't really, wasn't, it wasn't a positive experience. I w it was not a healing experience. No, um, honestly, um, I have a family member who who uh, frequently visits the, the hospital because of crises, and every single time, um, you know, they come out worse. Uh, doesn't surprise me. Okay, we need to um, wrap up. I'll leave it to you, Jennifer, to have everyone do closing notes. Okay, um, Kat, do you want to start? Um, okay, um, I guess I, what I want to say is I, I want to say thanks that this panel exists. And I'm really hoping that we see more and more panels like these integrated into writers' cons because what's great about writing cons is to learn new things. And I particularly love learning from people with a certain lived experience that I don't have. You know, even as a disabled person, I don't have all the disabilities. I don't have every single type of neurodivergence. So, um, so yeah, I guess I'm just sort of thankful that this panel happened. And um, again, you know, uh, thanks to the uh, people watching who seem really, really interested in this topic and pursuing more. Um, and yeah, I totally forgot to recommend the two anthologies I co-edited as sources of finding <laughs> disabled authors. Um, but yeah, Nothing Without Us, Nothing Without Us 2, the combination is about 49 authors. You could read their short stories and then go explore them uh, individually. And I also recommend Artificial Divide. It's another anthology produced by Renaissance where all of the authors and their protagonists are uh, blind, have low vision, or are visually impaired. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Thank you. Um, Ash? Um, if you're looking for more uh, nonfiction sources to learn more about uh, like crip theory and uh, disability and identity and how disabled people are, you know, describing their own lived experience. There's a lot of uh, memoirs coming out or out right now. Um, I would recommend Being Seen by Elsa Youngson or um, Year of the Tiger by um, Alice Wong. Um, I Would Die If I Was Like You is coming out by um, I'm forgetting all names right now. Uh, Imani Barbarin has that coming out. Like there's so many um, actual stories of disabled people that are so worth also reading in addition to, I mean, we want to be superheroes too, but um, 
we also haven't had enough people actually willing to listen to our actual stories. And so those are really worth looking up and uh, looking at. Thank you, Nathan. Definitely um, going to, to echo Kat's recommendations of Artificial Divide, Nothing Without Us, Nothing Without Us too. Um, and also uh, I wanna point out a couple of other things. Um, Kerfuffle is a, a novel that just came out about, uh, well, it, it's centered around the um, 2010 G20 protests in Toronto and it features a, a disabled protagonist um, who is, you know, sort of going around and, and putting people in their place and kicking ass uh, you know, and, and yeah. it's just very, very uh, good representation as well. But yeah, definitely read memoirs and read more works by disabled authors in general, um, that is all I could say. Thank you. And I just want to thank everyone for being on the panel, for letting me put this together. Um, I hope everyone will um, submit to Mighty when it um, opens in September and read it when it comes out. Um, thank you so much. Thank you. To oh, yes, sorry. Sorry, uh, recommendation in the chat, Care Work by Leah Lakshmi. Uh, it, it's very, very good. It's such a good book. Read it. <laughs> I will put all these links in the YouTube um, notes when, they, uh, when, when this comes out on the Taiki's YouTube page. Thank you. And thank you. I'm